You're listening to the Hello World podcast number 31. My name is Sean Wildmuth and I'm your host. The Hello World podcast is where you can hear from some of your favorite developers, authors, and speakers about how they got started in this business. We go way back to their first computer, their first code experience, and their first job. Today I have Joe Eames on the show. Joe began his love of programming on an Apple III in BASIC. Although his preferred language is JavaScript, he has worked professionally with many other languages and just about every major Microsoft language. He is currently a consultant and a freelance author for Pluralsight.com. Joe has always had a strong interest in education and has worked both full and part-time positions as a technical teacher for over 15 years. He's a frequent blogger and speaker, organizer of the AngularJS conference known as NGConf, organizer of the Utah JS user group, and a panelist on the JavaScript Jabber podcast. Today we dig into what it's like growing up in Utah and how we learn C++ by writing programs on paper without a computer anywhere in sight. Let's take a listen. Well, today I'm delighted to have Joe Eames on the show. How are you doing, Joe? Very well, thanks, Sean. And you're in Utah, is that correct? Yep. Utah. Land and it's of mountains. still winter. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, it'll be winter until late August. Okay, good. Good. I knew that um, summer was on a Wednesday this year in Utah, if I, if, if I have That's right. correct. That's right. <laughs> but that means the ski season goes that long as well. That's right. I wish I was a skier. Well, that does make it <laughs> less advantageous, I guess. Yeah, it really does. And you're a Pluralsight speaker. And what else have you done? I mean, what, what else do you do? Do you I have a consulting company and that sort of thing? Yeah, I'm doing a little bit of consulting just to kind of fill in the gaps just a little bit. So working with a few small clients, just a few hours a week. But primarily, I just author for Pluralsight full time. Awesome. That's exciting. I know that you've had yeah. some really popular courses lately. And I'm yeah. not envious at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know how that goes. Uh, Oh, I totally know how you mean, how you feel. <laughs> so, of course, the you know the idea of the show here is uh, I'm interested in how people got started, and so uh, you know what what was your start like? Did you grow up with a computer, or did uh, was this something you started in, in college? So, um, I was born in '75. Uh, so, PCs started make you know coming on the scene when I was around ten, and my dad was. He had some job that he was doing some accounting and stuff. So he actually bought quite a few computers. What, my very first computer was an Apple III. Apple III. Wow. Yeah. It's one of those ones not very many people have heard of. No. It didn't It didn't really do much. You had to run an, an emulator disk to emulate it to an Apple IIe, and then you could do things. <laughs> <laughs> so the, like, the Apple III-ness no one wrote software for so you did everything right. through an emulator interesting right very backwards everybody wanted to emulate backwards rather than go forwards that's interesting yeah it was one of those funny numbers that had the big huge base with the keyboard that was just built right into it and the monitor sat on top of that base oh, wow. and the monitor just fit into it perfectly and it had a two floppy disk drives instead of one we wow. were pretty cool and so you could make copies of anything you you wanted wasn't that the Indeed. purpose of two? I mean, that's what I hear right. from people. Yeah, that was. So and then we got some PCs a little bit after that. Um, I think our very per first PC was a 286. Um, we had a 386 and as well. And I mostly just played games on them. That's, oh, okay. That was my first experiences with computers. So playing Oregon games Trail on. and, and uh, that sort of thing or... I never did an Oregon Trail, strangely enough. I feel like I somehow missed out on something that was a part of uh, gaming history, you know? Yeah, so many people Oregon thought. Trail. Yeah. Yeah, right. No, uh, other other games, like some adventure-type games and oh, uh, nice. things like that. King, yeah, the King, very started... King's Quest? Yes, loved King's Quest. King's big Quest was a big one when I was a kid. Yeah. I, I never yeah, got I very far in it, though. I get a little frustrated and... Try to figure out how to, you know, cheat, but uh, it wasn't easy with King's Quest. Right. So right. when did that you start, you know, writing software? When did that become something that was interesting? Well, my very, very, very first experience with software was actually watching my sister use BASIC 
um, to program a choose your own adventure game written about the kids in my neighborhood growing up. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was this sort of satirical thing where you'd choose how you interact with uh, different characters in the game, which were the names of kids in our ward or uh, in our neighborhood growing up. And you would uh, make different choices and then they would do different things. It was always making fun of them. Sure. So <laughs> I, I, uh, I mostly just watched. That was my very first programming experience. Um, and then after that, I uh, in high school took uh, it was, I was actually taking compute co- college courses when I was, uh, in between my sophomore and junior year, I went up to the university, local university, university of Utah, I took one class and I took, um, I took a chemistry class at that time, but then I started taking other classes and I took a uh, computer science 105, oh, nice. which kind of introduced me to Pascal. Right. And I just fell in love with it. I actually completed the book way ahead of the class. I was done with all the entire course, I don't know, less than halfway through the, through the actual calendar schedule on the course. Wow. Yeah. I just absolutely loved it. And I was a, at that time I was into role-playing games, Dungeons and Dragons. So I actually started writing my own like assistant for the dungeon master (laughs) in Pascal command line, you know, help me create characters and monsters and roll dice. And (laughs) it was pretty (laughs) <laughs> pretty geeky not an uncommon story uh when chris oh. was on the show he talked about you know the character generator was the first uh was the ter- first basic app he wrote on an apple um, oh yeah that's funny yeah I, I, know, I hear this over and over and over again i thought oh i didn't even think to do that i was too busy you know <laughs> drawing on my character sheets <laughs> that's funny yeah you know i i look back at that and i do a lot of teaching now of course both publicly and uh, personally. And I um, always try to tell people, find something, you know, that you're really passionate about when you want to learn to program. And that's what will kick you into learning to program is wanting to build this app so bad that you just can't not do it, you know, and you'll get over any hurdle, no matter how difficult the technical challenges are, you'll get over them if you really want to bad enough. Yeah, because you want whatever the solution is, whether it's a... Exactly. Yeah, that's absolutely great advice. Great advice. Uh, yeah, uh, it wasn't the it wasn't the programming that I loved. It was building this thing, and then as I built it, that's how I learned to love the programming. Sure, because the beginning, no one would love. Right, it's just getting right. your head around it. That's not enjoyable, you know, almost at all at first because it's just frustration after frustration. Yeah, exactly. So what was funny is then right after that, I took a, another college course, Computer Science 201, um, which was like the first real programming course. No, no, no. I mean, I, it was Computer Science 202. I actually skipped 201. And the reason that I did um, was because I had taken 105 and thought that I could skip 201. Well, that turned out to be a terrible mistake, and I was going to flunk out of it and had to drop it. <laughs> and and uh, what was in 202 that that you needed to a one, you know, to understand, uh, you know, the teacher did a lot of like mapping of memory address locations and things like that. And I was watching him up there doing it and I just was completely lost. Right. Just so lost. It was what he was teaching. He, he, he was the guy who taught to a one. And so when he was teaching to a two, he's really building on what he'd done. And I, I was completely lost with what he was doing. That makes sense. So that was a little disheartening, but at the same time I was taking AP, um, calculus at high school mm-hmm. and the teacher only collected me- homework once a month. And I was extremely lazy and unmotivated and a big procrastinator. So the end of the month would come around and I'd have like 20 assignments due, and I'd scramble for a couple of days to try to finish them and only get five or 10 of them. So I started flunking out of computer science or sorry, flunking out calculus. of calculus. Wow. So I needed to get out of it and transfer out of it. Otherwise to avoid the F right. Well, the only thing, one of the things, the options to transfer into was computer science, AP computer science, but it was halfway through the year, right? Wow. And so they had the computer science year, and then you're supposed to take AP computer science after that. And all I had taken and completed was that 105 course at the university. But what was funny when I jumped into AP computer science halfway through the year, it actually seemed to fit right where I had left off with 105. <laughs> 
Because so, it was a high school course versus a yeah, college course. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And this was a three hour course. That 105 was a three hour course, not a five hour. So three hours of college is equal, equivalent to a year and a half in high school, apparently. <laughs> apparently. That's funny. And, yeah. and to, you were taking uh, uh, that course was in Pascal as well? Yep. That course was also in Pascal. So that was really nice. And did, did and, this make you believe this is what you wanted to do and go to college and get a job and, you know, sit behind a desk and curse about uh, yeah. and or, you know, configurations? Yeah. Yeah. That was pretty much the time when I had gone through 105 so fast and really enjoyed it. I started getting this clue that, boy, I really liked programming. And then I went into AP computer science and the kids who'd been doing it for a year and a half, they were all kind of doing OK. And I jumped into it and I was just thriving. And when we took the AP test, I came out of there knowing I had aced it. I knew I had a five right. and a lot of the other kids were like worried that they'd even passed it. And I was really just surprised. I, I thought it was super easy. I just, just felt like it was what I was meant to do. So I knew I wanted to, I just didn't know how to get into doing it professionally. And so did you then pursue college after high school? Yeah. So during my last year of high school, I had a job up at the University of Utah at the mail division and I was doing data entry, but there was a little bit of a, there was a DBase program that actually captured all the data entry. So I did a little tiny bit of maintenance on that, but at the same time I was kind of learning some DBase. Sure. Then I took this big long pause. Um, so that, even though that was technically my first job where I did some programming, I really you know, I'm over the course of the six or eight months I worked there, I probably did 10 or 20 hours worth of programming. Sure. And I took a big, long pause where I served a mission for the LDS church for two mm -hmm. years and didn't do anything <clears throat> until I'd been out there for a while. Um, I bought a C++ book because I'd always wanted to learn object-oriented programming mm -hmm. and C++. So I bought a book and I had no computer. So I literally was programming on paper. Wow. Was this during yep. the, when you were, uh, away with the mission or is yeah, this that's right. Wow. No, it was all, while I was on my mission, we, I didn't have a computer. There's no access to a computer this time. This is like in the early nineties. Sure. So, um, at night when I had a little bit of free time, you, you really don't get much. So we're talking like 20, 30 minutes a day. Yeah. Uh, I would open up that book and I'd read through it and I'd pull out paper and I would code by hand on a pad of paper. And so uh, I'm guessing that IntelliSense wasn't a big deal. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the IntelliSense was pretty poor at that point. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah. So I came back from that and uh, I taught myself some C++ and object oriented programming. And I still trying to get a job programming was not really realistic at that point. So I got a job at the, a place that I had worked doing data entry before, not the same one, but a different place. Sure. And it was this big company that grew really fast. They were just going crazy. And um, they were way into hiring low skill workers and then training them on the job. Oh, cool. So I'd hired to be like some kind of a semi-technical manager, but they didn't have a place, a spot for me. So I was just kind of like showing up and hanging out while they're waiting for this new think part to open up for me to go do what they had hired me for. And my boss's peer, another boss had come over to my boss and said, Hey, I need a programmer for a short while, a few weeks. Can I, you loan me one of yours? And he said, well, I don't have anybody free, but I've got this guy that's not doing anything for me right now. And I know that he's taken some programming courses in college. And so he came over and told me, Hey, we're loaning you out for a few weeks to a month. And I went over to the boss and this is at the beginning of a three day weekend. It was either Labor Day or Memorial Day. I can't remember right. which one. And he hands me the Fox Pro books, Fox Pro three, <laughs> Fox Pro two. They're, you know, they come in this big box and there's three or four of them. Yeah. Right. And the whole box weighs like 25 pounds. And he hands this box to me and he says, here's this. If you can do this when you come back from the three day weekend, then I want you to work for me. Wow. So again, I didn't have a computer at this point. <laughs> so you were or maybe just, I did. You were just I, I can't reading remember. the Fox Pro books. Right. But I remember that entire weekend. I just sat there and just read Fox Pro books. Wow. I came back on Monday and I was able to, you know, do some basic stuff. And he already had one programmer on staff. So I had somebody to ask some questions. And I can remember being so lost those first few weeks. That's just a, incredibly lost. Yeah. In those moments when you're like, I'm sure they're going to fire me. I'm sure they're going to fire mm -hmm. me. <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> like just doing the most basic things. I hadn't even learned to, you know, Fox Pro is mostly a database and yeah. just joining data was not something I knew how to do. So, and I, I had to do this task where I had to take two different tables of the same data and compare them and do something on them. So I was actually doing it by hand, you know, just to, just to get it done. Yeah, just to get it done, wow. I pulled up the two views side by side. <laughs> and uh, I pulled up those two views side by side. Sorry, let me... That's okay. Well, this. I can cut this out. So I pulled up those two views side by side and just did it by hand. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. Yeah. But did, and, uh, did that give you sort of that, you know... You, 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 you pass that point. Uh, my guess is that it just started to sort of click together and you're like, Oh, I'm not going to get, yeah, fired you know, today. it started, it started clicking together. The guy that was working there was very helpful. And in a neighboring department, there was another programmer that he and I kind of hit it off. So, um, I would over always go over there and ask him questions and he would, you know, give me, spend time with me. He's really nice. And I remember this funny experience where I was over there once talking to him and he worked with maybe two or three other programmers. And one of those programmers was kind of a, I don't know, kind of a, um, an a-hole to be honest. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> he was a bit of a jerk. And so one time I'm, I'm walking over there and he says to me, and I remember this very vividly, he says, he says, can't you go get your own work done rather than making us do your work for you? Something to that effect. I can't. But luckily, I can't remember. You, you've let it go. You're not hanging on to it at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would totally let that go. That's funny. Hey, can we pause for a quick second? Yeah. What? Mom, Tell mom I'm recording right now. I'm, I'm recording a podcast, and I'll call her when I'm done. Okay. So, um, yeah. That was a funny experience because it was right in that time. I'd been there maybe a month or two and Fox Pro had its own language for doing joins of tables and sorting and filtering and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But they still supported SQL. And so I started reading, you know, I'd go home at night and I would read and I had this peer that I worked with. And when he went home at night, he wanted to make extra money. He'd actually take home data entry. So I was making like seven and a half dollars an hour and the data entry people, they made like 10. Right. Yeah. So this guy would take home the data entry stuff and work to make extra money. Meanwhile, I was taking home the Fox Pro books and reading. So I, um, I started learning about SQL and learned how to do it. And I realized I was the only person in this company. They had like 40 programmers. I was the only person at the company that knew SQL. Wow. Nobody else had bothered to learn it. Because you could do so, it all with the, uh, with the, the, the D-based derived language. Yeah. Yeah. They just... Um, not very much. I mean, I, there might have been a couple that did, but of the vast majority of programmers that I knew, I talked to a lot of them and none of them had heard of SQL. Wow. And so th did that bring you a place in the company that, uh, you know, sort of elevated you or what happened there? Um, so what happened was I got another job. <laughs> it was the 90s, wasn't it? It was. Yeah, <laughs> this was a really good time. So this was 97, um, yeah. I think. And uh, I saw a listing in the paper. I I'd worked that first job maybe six months. Uh -huh. I saw a listing in the paper, called on it. Guy really liked me. I came in and um, that, it was a, that was a really cool job. The guy who uh, hired me, he'd started up the company. He was um, on his way to becoming a huge uh, venture capitalist here in the Valley. At this point, he'd la launched like three different successful businesses and he'd written all the code. And because I had done data entry for my first jobs for like three years, I was a super fast typer or typist. Right. Sure. And he and I would work together and he was just amazed at how fast I could type. And he, in his mind, that translated to just me being super effective as a programmer. <laughs> well, there, so he was so there is something we should mention to some of the younger folks listening to the podcast. Uh, there was a time when they used to put ads for jobs in newspapers. So maybe we mm -hmm. should explain what a newspaper is. Wait, no. Okay. Let's go on. Go on. <laughs> hey, uh, as an aside, quick question. How long are we going for again? Uh, about another 10 to 15 minutes. So, uh, till about a quarter till. Okay. Is that a problem? Nope. That's okay. fine. Um, my son's late for something, but it'll just have to wait. Okay. Um, 
So you right, thought you so, were a, a, you were a fast developer or an effective de- the developer because you could type fast. Yeah, yeah, that was really a big a big boon for me in my career <laughs> at that point was just being able to type fast. Wow. So I worked at this place and I took over and did all the coding and um and after about this a Fox year, Pro as well. Yeah, this was Fox Pro as well. So by this time, it'd become Visual Fox Pro. Right. Visual Fox Pro came about this time. So things were pretty cool at that point. I'll be honest, I miss Fox Pro. You know, there were some really cool things about it that you could do that you just can't do in other languages today. There's a lot of a lot of you guys out there. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few. I actually uh, interviewed for a consulting gig where they were converting a program from Fox Pro, and I just couldn't believe there's any Fox Pro still in production today. Oh, tons. You have no idea. You have no idea. I did a, a Fox Pro user group about three years ago, and these guys have been running the, the group forever, and they know each other. They know each other's wives and kids. It's, it's this incredibly insular group um, because they're the only ones left that can keep all this production code alive. So um, at that time, this was a, there was a huge boom going on locally here in uh, the Salt Lake Valley for training for the uh, MCSE certification. Oh yeah, you remember that? I do. There was there was a it was a huge thing going on. People were getting their MCSEs, and it was a way to get into the industry. You'd go and take these three to six eight month courses, get that certification, and then you could get a job. And people were you know were hiring up these MCSEs by the dozens, and Salt Lake just became this huge place for it. It became a mecca. So people were coming from all over the country here to go go to school. And uh, one of the schools that uh, was around here was called CTI. And uh, I went and checked the place out. It looked pretty good. They were planning on doing a programming track, which is why I initially went there, but they weren't quite ready for it. And so instead, I actually took the networking track instead. Interesting. And it was an 18-month track, I want to say. Wow. Or, or eight, eight-month track. It was it was pretty long. Uh I took the track and when I was done, I really liked what they were doing. So I actually took a job as a teacher there, a full-time job teaching. Yeah. Quit my job at the place where I was programming, started up in the early summer and started teaching there, teaching networking. And and is that something that you knew you were going to enjoy or is this a bit of a risk? You know, it was a little bit of a risk, but it just seemed pretty exciting and they were paying well and sure. It was just a way to tack something else onto my career. So it was kind of fun. What was even more fun was when they started bouncing paychecks because the guys that were running the show were basically running a big pyramid scheme and stealing from Paul to pay Peter. And wow. uh, yeah, that is not fun. Was, no, maybe the opposite of. <laughs> yeah, but it taught me a little bit of fortitude about, um, you know, taking the latest, jumping on the latest and greatest bandwagon. If you're going to do that, you got to be ready to face the consequences of, you know, rocky employment. So I'm working at this networking company, right? Teaching and really enjoying it. We were teaching a class of like 16 was the class size, I think. Nice. And I really had a fun time, but then they went belly up. Uh, these guys, they were trying to open up another location in, uh, California and they were driving Vipers and staying in five star hotels when they traveled around and they were taking half the money up front and they were prom- and wanted the other half at the back end, but the finances definitely didn't work out for the costs. So it was yeah. kind of a, they had to keep getting more students to pay for the existing students uh, costs and finally went belly up. So I went back to the place that I was at before. I actually did it twice. I, I, I left them quit and then came back. And every time I came back, I got like a 40% raise because they were so desperate to have me. Wow. And then at the end of three years, that company had been sold off to another company that hired a new manager. He didn't like me. And that was the first time I got fired. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, but, but not the last, I mean, that's what it sounds like. Uh, <laughs> no, that was actually the last time I got fired. Um, Thankfully it was the last time I got fired. Yeah. Only time. So it was, it was, it was another good experience was getting fired. So when you made the, it seems like at some point you made the transition from, uh, you know, visual Fox pro to, uh, the web in some way, because that's a lot of the courseware yeah. that you do. And especially with the, the, the angular course, that's, you know, continually number one or number two, um, uh, on plural site. What was that? What was that transition like? So after the job at Fox pro, I picked up a job in visual basic and it was close enough. And I'd done looked at it enough that 
uh, I was able to pick that up. Sure. And they were doing a web application and I wasn't really doing web stuff myself at the time. I was more doing backend stuff at that mm-hmm. place, but I started to pick up a little bit of uh, web technology at this point. And this is right around 99. So the dot com bubble was in full swing. Yeah. You know, and I had that short job with Visual Basic and then picked up another job. I think I was only there for three months, picked up another job. It was started in Visual Basic, but then dot net was coming out. And so we ended up switching over. We knew we were going to switch over to .NET. We did ASP at that point right. until .NET came out. So um, right in that 2000, 2001 time frame. When everything switched. Yep, when everything switched. So we did a bunch of stuff in ASP. And at that point, I was just doing more and more. So it was kind of a natural progression from Fox Pro to Visual Basic to ASP. You know, ASP is just kind of a VB scripty language. Right. So... And at that point, nobody knew how to do web programming. So they weren't looking for web programming experience. They were looking for visual basic experience. Right. So people were building these websites because that's all that anybody had. And almost all if the you, code was in the back end. But anyway, they were just spitting yeah. out uh, HTML and uh, the whole Java, async JavaScript story, you know, really hadn't started for a number of years after, uh, after that, I would assume. Right. Right. And I was also lucky in that we didn't build much in ASP. So when .NET came around, I didn't have to continue to maintain a big ASP project, which would have been, you know, terrible. Yes. Uh, Except for those of you who are listening to the show that still are doing it. I'm sure it's rewarding work. (laughs) Yes. Yes, I'm sure. (laughs) I'm I'm sure they can feel my pain. I've I've had to maintain ASP sites uh, since then. And it's rough. It is, you know, compared to current current technologies and languages, it's definitely got a lot of uh, drawbacks. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so, where did your uh, uh, career take you as far as uh, when you got into Angular? I mean, because that that uh, by the time I saw you were working on the Angular course, I was just starting to look at it. You know, I heard sort of right. you know a lot of people talking about about it, but uh, I feel I felt a little behind the curve. It, was this something that uh, was big at one of the your jobs, or where did that come from? Well, I actually picked up Angular while working for Pluralsight as a contractor. Oh, really? I yeah. Didn't. Yeah, pretty funny. Um, leading up to that point, right around uh, 2007, 2008, um, I was still working at that one job, which was crazy for me because – I was a job hopper, a big time job hopper Right in my 18, let's see, 19 years, 18 years, I've had around 18 jobs. So I was averaging a job a year, mm-hmm. but I'd been at that job for like two, three years. And then I, I think I switched to another one that I was there for like six years. But through those two jobs, I was getting more and more into the web and jQuery started coming out. And then I started, uh, then, then uh, knockout came out. Right. And for me, this was a big, huge transition point in my career. I was doing a side project where we needed to do a web page that was kind of a little bit like a, a an Excel spreadsheet. Nothing so grandiose and feature rich. It was just uh, type in a few numbers here and then see a number over on the side and make sure that the numbers added up. Right. But it was something that you just could not do with postbacks. So I had to dig in and learn JavaScript. And at this time, you know, everybody did a little bit of JavaScript and everybody hated it. Right. Nobody knew JavaScript. The only only the guys who were building jQuery knew knew JavaScript. Right. And everybody else thought it was a terrible language. We all were just enamored with C sharp, and we didn't want to do any JavaScript. And so, unlike now, so where I, everyone does a lot of JavaScript and everybody hates it, is, is that right? The, the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's a pretty fair statement. <laughs> but I just became enamored with what you could do on the client side and how awesome you could make user user interfaces. And this the side project I was building just was very popular, very well received. And I loved that ability to create something that users just loved. Yeah. So I made a set set again, excites them. Yeah, Yeah, it really does. So I made a conscious choice to go more towards the front end. I was, you know, just a typical web program at this point, doing a lot of backend code, doing some HTML, CSS, and occasionally jQuery. And I said to myself, the, the world's changing. I saw knockout. I knew that things were going to change and client side development was just going to get cheaper and cheaper and more popular. So I wanted to be part of that. And that's what's cool about programming, right? These things change and all of a sudden something new is going crazy and nobody knows how to do it. And if you're one of the people doing it, it's like being in the wild west. You can 
one, make a big name for yourself, but two, you can contribute to something just super cool. Yeah. And, and, and make a meaningful contribution and really change the industry and be part of an amazing thing. And so that's what I wanted to do. So I took a job where I thought I was going to be doing a bunch of JavaScript. Turns out I wasn't. And I let them know, hey, uh, this isn't what I thought I wanted to do. I th- I, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. And so I left and Pluralsight at that point needed a contractor to come on and build the HTML5 video player that everybody uses now to watch Pluralsight sure. uh, on the PC. So they were using Silverlight at that time. They wanted to go to HTML5 video, and I had the skills. I'd been doing a bunch of that. So I came on and did just pair programming with Jim Cooper, one of Plural Sites developers. And he and I built this kind of, it was a very interesting application because first we did a proof of concept that we could really make it work. Then we threw away 100% of the code, and we started over, and we test drove and built the same application with just raw JavaScript, no framework. I'd known Backbone and Knockout at this point, but I wasn't really crazy about either of them. And as we started building it in raw JavaScript, it just started getting too complex and we really needed a framework. Sure. So anybody that I read that says, you don't need a framework, you don't need a JavaScript framework, I tell them they're crazy because I've been there, tried to build something big without a JavaScript framework and it just doesn't work. At least it didn't for me. So... We were looking around and I'd looked at, we saw Ember. And at this point, Ember was such in its infancy. And Pluralsight is a full 100% pair, 100% test driven shop. So we had to be able to test and test drive the code. And you just couldn't at that point in Ember. I know the story's changed today. Sure. But at that point, you really could not. We, we Googled for hours and nobody was talking about testing in Ember. And then Jim stumbled upon Angular and he said, hey, there's this Angular thing and it's, it says it's built on testing. So we checked it out and within like eight hours, we had replaced just about everything that we'd done already in Angular. And we were just enamored by this point. Wow. And we just took off, spent a total of a couple of months and built the uh, majority of the HTML5 player. Then I left and they they added a bunch to it since then. But that was my first introduction to Angular was building the wow. the Pearl Sites video player. I had no idea that one, it was yeah. built with Angular and two, that the that you were a major contributor there. That's amazing. Yeah. So yeah, t- very cool project as a, you know, as a working developer, I mean, I know that you're, you're doing a lot of plural site and, and you do consulting. If you had to, if you could go back to, you know, the 20 year old Joe and give him some advice, what would you tell him? I probably, you know, and this is, a viewpoint that is very based on what I'm doing right now. Right. Mm-hmm. So if you ask me the same question in 10 years, I'd probably have an entirely different answer. I expect. Yeah. But I would have told them to, uh, not fear JavaScript cause I feared it for so long and I really shouldn't have, if I had gotten into it earlier, there was a lot of other cool things I could have done and been involved in Sure. that I wasn't. Absolutely. But I would say that would be my number one piece of advice that, and I really wish that I had taken a job where all, all I did was take, you know, Photoshop website designs and implement them in HTML and CSS because I've always felt like my CSS is not as strong as I want it to be, my layout skills. And I wish that I had had a job, kind of like the job doing data entry. I'm glad I did that. Really glad that I had a job doing data entry and learned to type fast. But I wish that I had learned the CSS a lot better than I learned. I know it now. I, I could see that. I could see that. But I, I think both that and JavaScript are both great advice for, for some of the young developers listening. So thanks a lot for that. Yeah. Well, I, this has been a great show. I really appreciate you coming on and uh, talking about your, your story. And, uh, and I hope that uh, everything uh, in Utah gets warmer for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs>